Hallelujah. I love Brother Jesse. Sure glad God brought him into my life. You know, I listen to all these speakers, and there's a couple of things I picked up that Jesse said. Number one, he said he's taller than me. And number two, he said, I love imagination. Put the two together. What a dreamer. <laughs> he is taller than me, but it's the heels on his shoes that makes the difference. I'll let him be taller. That's okay. Got your Bibles with you? Yesterday, I shared with you that the Lord had said to me a few months ago, don't ever stop teaching on the power of the blessing and teaching people how to walk in his favor. And he said, it is the solution and the answer to the chaos that is in your world today. Learning how to walk in God's blessing, learning how to walk in his favor. I'm telling you, when that becomes a revelation to you, then your days of failure and defeat will soon be over, praise God. Look at somebody and say, thank God for the blessing. blessing. Say, thank God for his favor. And then smile real big at somebody and say, and I have them both. Hallelujah. And go ahead and give the Lord a good praise for it. Amen. We closed the service yesterday from John 10, 10. You all know it. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. The Amplified Bible. I came that they may have and enjoy life, have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Jesus wants us living life to the full, overflowing life. I love the message translation, better life than they've ever dreamed of. Better life than you've ever dreamed of. That's the kind of life that he gave his life for you and I to enjoy. And I testify today and I say it to his glory. Uh, I am presently living life better than I ever dreamed of. Growing up, I never knew life could be this good. You know, as a young man, I didn't know that life could be this good. It wasn't until I began to discover from the Word of God, and thank God for Brother Copeland, who was instrumental in bringing those revelations to me 44 years ago. And then the things the Lord began to teach me and teach me how to walk in, And from that time until now, it has been what I describe as adventures in faith and life better than I've ever dreamed of. And that's the way you should be able to describe your life better than you ever dreamed of. Is that the way you would describe your life today? If not, then you need to get a deeper revelation of the power of the blessing and the ability of God's favor on your life. Now, if you're not living life better than you ever dreamed of, then if I were you, I'd get fighting mad today because you're being robbed. That's not the way God wants you to live. Anything less than better than you ever dreamed of is not the way God wants you to live. So determine right now, if you haven't already, that you're not going to let the devil get away with this any longer. God's Word says that one of the primary reasons why that God's people don't enjoy his best is a lack of knowledge. Well, you just sit in here for the rest of the week and you will leave this week no longer lacking knowledge. Hallelujah. You're going to hear some things that will be life-changing. No matter what level your life may be at this very moment, there's always another level, praise God. And I believe God wants to take you there. Can you say amen? Now, I want you to listen to Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to read it from the message translation, a portion of it, beginning in verse 13. This is what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He became a curse and at the same time dissolved the curse. And now because of that, the air is cleared and we can see that Abraham's blessing 
is present and available. We are all able to receive just the way Abraham received it. The air is cleared because of what Jesus did at Calvary, and now Abraham's blessing is present and it is available. We are all able to receive. So that tells me that this is not just for a few, a select few, but every person in this auditorium has a right to walk in the blessing of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You have a right to expect it to manifest in your life. And as we discovered yesterday, you can't have the blessing without favor. They are divinely linked. The blessing is part of our covenant and favor is a major characteristic of the blessing. Genesis 12, the Amplified Version, God says to Abram, I will bless thee. The Amplified Version says, and give you an abundant increase of favors. Psalm 5, verse 12, the Lord will bless the righteous and with favor will he compass them or surround them. So notice in both verses, blessing and favor are both mentioned. So you can't have the blessing without favor. And thank God if you have the blessing, then you've got favor. And the only problem is most of God's people don't know how to walk in them. They don't know how to appropriate it. You know, it's a sad thing when the only time the word blessing is used in your house is when somebody sneezes. Hello? You ought to be talking the blessing all the time. Become so blessing and favor-minded that you get up expecting it to manifest every day of your life. Can you say amen? amen? God wants every day to be a blessing day. Every day to be a blessing day. That blessing is on us just like it was on Abraham, just like it was on Isaac, just like it was on Jacob, just like it was on Joseph, just like it was on David. That same blessing is on us today and can do for us what it did for them. Yesterday I talked to you and showed you from the Word uh, several uh, references of how the blessing enabled God's people to overcome adversity. And it'll do the same for you and me today. Another wonderful thing about the blessing in Genesis 24, 1, it says the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. By the time he was a very, very old man, God had blessed him in all things. The message translation says, had blessed him in every way. How would you like for everything you do to have God's blessing on it? Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? Well, that's the way God wants you to live. Listen to the contemporary English version. The Lord made him rich and he was successful in everything he did. He was successful in everything that he did. That tells me that when the blessing is operating in your life, and when the favor of God is operating in your life, then your philosophy is no longer win a few, lose a few. Right. Amen. He was successful in everything that he did. Is that possible for you and me? Well, if the same blessing that was on Abraham is now on us, then it is certainly possible that we can be successful in everything we do and in every way. Look at somebody say, I receive that in Jesus' name. Jesus. Hallelujah. That would also imply that the blessing was working for him every day. Even in his challenges, the blessing would show up. No foe could defeat him. No crisis could stop him. The blessing worked in his behalf day in and day out. And it's designed by God to do the very same thing for you and me today. The Noah Webster 1828 edition dictionary, if you don't have one, I'd strongly suggest that you get one. In fact, you can now download it as an app on your iPhone, praise God, on your iPad. I'm telling you, I love it. I carry it around with me everywhere I go. I mean, right next to my Bible in my library is my Noah Webster 1828 edition dictionary. And the reason I love it so much is because it not only gives you definitions, but scripture references as well. 
Now, here's what that particular dictionary states, that when you have been blessed, then happiness, favor, prosperity, and success have been pronounced upon you. Look at somebody and say, I am blessed. blessed. Now, what that means, according to the Noah Webster 1828 edition dictionary, when you say, I'm blessed, then that means happiness, favor, prosperity, and success have been pronounced upon you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then the word pronounced literally means to confer or to invoke. And the same dictionary states that when the word confer or invoke is used, it's used to express the grant of favors, benefits, and privileges to be enjoyed not only now, but permanently. Hallelujah. I love that. When the blessing of God has been pronounced upon your life, then that means that you are now the beneficiary of favors, benefits, and privileges that are to be enjoyed right now and permanently, praise God. Look at somebody and say, I am presently blessed and I am permanently blessed. And I think you ought to give the Lord a shout over that. Amen. (laughs) Glory to God. Permanently blessed. Now, if I am permanently blessed, that means that I can count on it working for me in the good times as well as the bad times. Hallelujah. No matter what's going on in our world around us, we have something on us. And remember, I used this term yesterday. And if you didn't write it down, write it down now. When the blessing of God is on you and the favor of God is on you, you are now superior to your circumstances. Amen. Amen. Superior to your circumstances. And that means no matter what's going on around you, good or bad, recession, depression, bad economy, there's something on you and it's on you permanently and it makes you superior to your circumstances. Can you say amen? Amen. I love Psalm 3.8. It says, thy blessing is on thy people. And the next closing word in that reference or verse is Selah. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Selah means stop and think about this. Stop and meditate on this. See, that's where so many of God's people are missing it. They they hear things like this, but they don't take time enough to meditate upon it. And it's the meditating upon it and running it over and over in your thinking saying it over and over, pondering upon it, thinking about it when you're driving to work, thinking about it when you get up, thinking about it before you go to bed, wake up thinking about it. That's where most of God's people are missing it. They only hear it, but they don't meditate upon it. And consequently, it never becomes deeply rooted in their hearts and it's no longer, or it never becomes a revelation. But when it becomes a revelation, nobody can take it away from you. And you say, amen. Amen. I know that I know that I know the blessing of God is on my life. The blessing is not out here somewhere, and I'm trying to get it. The favor of God is not out there somewhere, and I'm trying to get it. I let the Word of God be final authority, and if He says His blessing is upon me, then as far as I'm concerned, that settles it. His blessing is upon me, and if it is upon me now, it is upon me forever, and if it can do for Abraham, whatever it could do for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Daniel, David, and all the rest of them, then just add Jerry's name to the list. It'll do it for me. Hallelujah. And it'll do it for you. Can you say amen? Amen. Say the blessing of God God is on my life. life. Amen. Amen. So that would say to me, stop praying for it. 
Why would I want to ask God for something He says I've already got? Thank you for your enthusiasm. Amen. You know, I, I think that's one of the ways the devil has kept the body of Christ blinded to these things. You know, we just become religious and use things from the Bible in a religious way. And consequently, they never have an effect on our lives. Jesus said, your religious traditions make the commandments of God of no effect. And so people just go around, you know, uh, praying, oh, Lord, bless us. Amen. Let's make sure we, we don't close the prayer without, Lord, bless us. Well, why would I ask him to do something for me that he says he's already done? The blessing is on me. Rather than ask him for it, I prefer to thank him for it. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank him for what he says has already been accomplished. Praise God. Look at somebody and tell them, the blessing is on me. The favor of God is on me. I am now superior to my circumstances. And give the Lord another shout. Amen. Now, not only does this Noah Webster dictionary say that when you are blessed and the blessing has been conferred or pronounced upon you, that it is there permanently, but even the Bible says that. David said this in 1 Chronicles 17, 27. He said, for thou blessest, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. In other words, what he's saying is, once God blesses something, then it is blessed forever. Well, he blessed me. He blessed you. That means you're blessed forever. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, go ahead and touch me. It'll be all right. <laughs> Ask him, how does it feel to set somebody, set next to somebody like me? Hallelujah. Amen. For thou blesseth, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. Now, I love the message translation here too. It says, because you have blessed it, God, it's really blessed. <laughs> blessed for good. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not only blessed, I'm really blessed. <laughs> so I say, why do you have us repeat stuff all the time? Because I want to. It's my service. <laughs> That's how you get it in you. Repetition. Hallelujah. Amen. So say it again. I'm blessed. Really blessed. I, I need for you to put some emphasis on the really blessed part. Say it again. I'm blessed. Really blessed. Amen. And then the New Living Translation says, for when you, Lord, grant a blessing, it is an eternal blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Eternal. I'm eternally blessed. Well, if I'm eternally blessed, then Satan is eternally defeated. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. We need to get a deeper revelation of the power of the blessing and how to walk in God's favor. It is the answer to all the chaos in your world today. If you learn how to walk in the blessing, appropriate the blessing, learn how to walk in the favor of God, it makes no matter what's happening around you, then his blessing and his favor makes you superior to it. You will not be suppressed by it you will overcome it. Hallelujah. The blessing is on your life forever. And we can count on it being on us for the rest of our lives. And that goes for favor as well. Now, Psalm 30 verse 5 from the New American Standard says this. His favor is for a lifetime. His favor is for a lifetime. The New International Version says... His favor lasts a lifetime. So what have I discovered? Think about it for a moment. His blessing 
is on my life eternally. His blessing is on my life forever. His favor lasts a lifetime. So how can I lose? If his blessing is on my life forever and his favor is for a lifetime, then how can I lose? This is why David made this statement in Psalm 41, 11. By this I know that you favor me because my enemy doth not triumph over me. What's David saying? I know I have the favor of God on my life. And here's how I know. Because my enemy never triumphs over me. Hallelujah. Amen. The message translation says it this way. There are no victory shouts from the enemy's camp. Amen. Hallelujah. There are no victory shouts from the enemy's camp. You see, when you're walking in the blessing of God and you're walking in the favor of God, it silenced the enemy's camp. Hallelujah. There, are, there is no shouting going on over there. Just weeping and crying and wailing and gnashing and sorrow because they know that with the favor of God and the blessing of God on your life, then they are helpless, they are hopeless, they cannot defeat you, they cannot overcome you, you have something on your life that makes you superior. Come on, give the Lord a good shout of praise. Amen. It'll enable you to rise above everything Satan or the world throws your way. So I challenge you today, get up every morning thanking God for the blessing, thanking God for his favor. Why don't we do that right now? Just lift both hands and you just express it in your own way. But thank God for the blessing and thank God for his favor. Come on, voice it. Voice it out loud. Voice it with some enthusiasm. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did at Calvary so that the blessing of God would come on my life. Thank you, Father, for your favor. And thank you that it's for a lifetime. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord your best shout this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every day, thank God for his blessing. Every day, thank God for his favor. Learn to rely upon them more than ever before. Learn how to draw from them, how to make a demand upon them. Never go another day without expecting the blessing of God and the favor of God to show up in your life. It's a wonderful way to live. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Now, go with me to Psalm 19, or I'm sorry, Psalm 68 and verse 19. And this is where I got the title to my newest book. Every day, a blessing day. Every day, a blessing day. As I said when the Lord said, don't ever stop teaching on the blessing and on favor, then we began to put out new resources, uh, focusing on the teaching on the blessing and favor, and, and just finished uh, two new books on favor and the blessing, new curriculum on favor, so that we can help the body of Christ get a deeper understanding of how to appropriate and how to walk in these powerful spiritual forces because once again, it's what's going to get you over in these last days. Psalm 68, look at verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. And notice that little word once again, Selah. Blessed be the Lord God who daily if I shout daily, daily. what does daily mean? Daily. Every day. Amen? Amen. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. Selah. 
In other words, notice he's saying, hey, stop and think about this. Get a revelation of this. I think it's interesting that both in Psalm 3, verse 8, where he said his blessing is upon us, and here in Psalm 68, 19, he daily loadeth us with benefits, and both verses have selah at the end of them. Sounds like to me God is saying, if you get a revelation of the fact that my blessing is already on you, and through the blessing it will make daily provision for you, then your life will never be the same. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and tell them, something should be happening to me because of the blessing and because of favor every day of my life. Amen. Every day of my life. The blessing should be showing up. The favor of God should be showing up. Amen. I expect it every day. And I'm not disappointed. Now, the Lord taught me many years ago. Now, this, this has got to be at least over 35 years ago. He said, son, every time the blessing or the favor of God manifests in some way in your life, no matter how minute it might seem or how big it might be, stop right then and say out loud, acknowledge it and say, that's the favor of God. And he said, the more you do that, the more favor minded you will become. Not only that, your expectation of it showing up more frequently will increase. Now, for instance, if you got a decent parking place out there and you didn't have to walk seven blocks, when you got that parking place, say out loud, I don't care who's there, sinner or believer. That's the favor of God. You mean over a parking place? Yeah. I came through uh, town one day, and I don't get downtown, but about once a year for a believer's convention, <laughs> even though I live here. But uh, I had to serve on jury duty, or I had to, you know, be there for jury duty. So I had to come downtown. And it's very seldom I come down here. But I didn't have to stop at one intersection. The lights turned green every time I approached them. And I just said, that's the favor of God. <laughs> well, that was just a coincidence. Well, it may be for you, but for me, I acknowledge it as the favor of God. And then when I got to the courthouse... And I sat in there with, you know, several hundred people waiting to see if I'm selected, you know, to be on jury duty. And uh, they started calling out all these names and they'd si assign them to an, a court here and a court there and a court here. And I'm sitting there just like everybody else. And finally they called my name and said, you can go home. I said, that's the favor of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the favor of God. Amen. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to, you know, particularly when I was overseas and trying to get back home and maybe had to change my schedule, come home earlier or later and had to change my flight schedule. And, you know, sometimes you just, in the natural, you just don't get any flight you want, any seat you want and that kind of thing. But I start confessing the favor of God. And I can't tell you the number of times, particularly in London Heathrow, <laughs> that I've gone up to the counter after already having called ahead of time and found out that flight's not available. It's booked. There are no seats available. And I went in faith anyway, believing for favor, and get to the counter. And if my national director who runs our ministry in Europe was standing here next to me, he could testify to you that it's not happened once, but many times. And he just shakes his head. He said, you beat anything I ever seen. The favor of God is on your life. And, and walk up to the British Airways counter and say, uh, I need to be on this next flight to, uh, you know, JFK or 
DFW, whatever. Well, I'm sorry, there are no seats available. Uh, it's totally booked. I say, well, I understand that. They told me that on the phone, but uh, that's subject to change. <laughs> Pardon me? I said, that's subject to change. No, sir, it's, it's set. It's, you know, every seat's taken. I said, I understand that, but I have favor. What? Favor. I have the favor of God. Well, we don't know about that, but we know every seat is booked. And I just stand there and smile at them. And in a little while, another lady came out from an office back there and came up and said, could I help you? And I noticed she had supervisor written across the front. I said, yes, ma'am. I, I need to be on this, this flight. She looked in the computer and said, well, uh, like my assistant said, it's totally booked. I said, she said that and I appreciate that, but I'm believing for favor. Favor? <laughs> yes, ma'am. She said, well, I don't know what that is, but it's, it's booked. She said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll be right back. And she went back there and she came back and called, uh, come back and she said, we had three dignitaries that were going to be flying today. And one of them had told me a few days ago that he might not be able to make the trip. And he'd let me know in advance uh, if he was going to have to cancel or not. She said, I just called his office, a government official. And sure enough, he's having to uh, cancel. He won't be on this flight. She said he had row one first class. Would you like to have his seat? I said, uh, the favor of God has not only got me a seat, but I am now a dignitary. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm sitting next to government officials. Hallelujah. I remember one time I was flying back from Los Angeles. And uh, a flight attendant come up there and she said, I know who you are and I've got one of your books in my purse and I'm going to come up here when I get through serving the people and I want you to autograph it for me. I said, I'd be happy to. So she came up there, but she brought another flight attendant with her. She said, she has one of your books too. And she wants you to autograph her book. I said, I'd be happy to. So I'm autographing their books and they, they've knelt down in the floor there between the aisles, you know, and we're talking and I'm signing their books. And a little while the captain came out to go to the uh, laboratory and he said, Jerry Savell, I didn't know you was on my flight. He said, I'll be right back. And he came and he knelt down there and we're all talking and just having a good time and preaching. And he, he, he is just thrilled. He said, man, I listen to you all the time, Brother Copeland. I love you guys. And he said, I am honored to be on your flight. He said, when we land, let me get your luggage for you. I'll get it done and I'll take it to the gate for you. I said, well, you don't have to. No, I'd count it an honor. And so well, this lasted for quite some time. And then they all left. And the guy sitting next to me said, who are you? <laughs> I said, highly favored, thank you. <laughs> he said, well, I don't know who you are, but I ain't had no service since you sat down. <laughs> Amen. The favor of God. The favor of God. Now, that's not only produced a seat when there were no seats, a parking place when there were no parking places. You know, 50% off on suits when I never asked for a discount. You know, wholesale price on an automobile instead of retail when I didn't even ask for it. <laughs> Land. Oh, when I, when I first started studying the favor of God years ago, I found out that one of the major characteristics or benefits of the favor of God in the Bible is Land. Anybody believing for land today? Keep your hand up. In fact, if you're believing for land today, stand up. Man, I'm telling you, the favor of God can get you land when there is no land. The favor of God can cause you to have it when nobody else can have it. Hallelujah. And the favor of God can cause you to get it at a price that nobody else can get it at that price. Lord, I thank you for your favor manifesting in their behalf and causing them to have the land 
they desire and not have to pay the world's price, we decree favor. Come on, give the Lord a shout, hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. The favor of God got us some land uh, a few years ago that has increased in value and continued to increase in value and continued to increase in value. In fact, Brother Copeland prophesied over me in 1981 in Philadelphia and said, Jerry, God's about to just hand over some exceeding valuable land to you. Well, I confessed that and held fast to it for many, many years. And then when it happened, at the time it happened, it didn't look like exceeding valuable land, but it has become exceeding valuable land. And I had developers here in Fort Worth come to my office wanting to know, how did you get that land when we've been trying to get it? I said, the favor of God. And this other guy said, no, really, how did you get it? I said, the favor of God. No, I know, seriously, how, who do you know? I said, God. Amen. Amen. And one of them finally said, well, I don't know anything about that, but I sure like for you to teach me. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. The favor of God. And thank God you have it right now. Amen. You are just as much entitled to walk in it as I am. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now let's look at this again. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. What are benefits? Benefits. What does that mean? Well, I looked up in my dictionary and one of the definitions of benefits is something that aids or promotes well-being. Anything that aids or promotes well-being. It's God doing whatever is necessary to make your life better. And notice it says he'll do it daily. I'm supposed to be having things happen to me that come from God daily. See, when you develop that kind of attitude, then you never have blue Mondays again or terrible Tuesdays and oh my God, Wednesdays. Every day a blessing day. Say it with me. Every day a blessing day. Look at your neighbor and tell him, something good coming from God should be happening to you every day. Every day. Now I like this word loadeth. He loadeth us daily with benefits. Another word for loadeth is heap. In fact, I believe that's where we probably got this phrase. That guy's loaded. You ever heard anybody describing somebody that's well off? You know, wealthy, rich, perhaps. Why did they describe him? He loaded. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm loaded. Glory to God. Like Brother Copeland said the other night, when he got a revelation of this, he just shouted, I'll never be poor another day in my life. Somebody shout that right now. I'll never be poor another day of my life. Say it again. I'll never be poor another day of my life. And then look at somebody and tell them, and the reason why, I'm loaded. Hallelujah. He daily loadeth us with benefits. He's daily heaping upon us things that promote well-being. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Now, in um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, you don't have to turn there and just make a note of it. It says, and this is found in what is uh, traditionally referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And listen to this statement. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Sounds like to me Jesus is saying we should be receiving something from God every day. If your testimony is, well, back in 1974, I'm telling you, God really did some things for me. Folks, this is 2013. Is that the last time you've seen a blessing? <laughs> Jesus said in the model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Bread is symbolic of sustenance. That which sustains. It's symbolic of provision. So Jesus seems to think it's all right for you and I to expect to receive provision daily from our Father. And that's what the blessing of God will do. Can you say amen? amen. Listen to this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. And ye shall teach them your children, talking about God's word, God's laws. You shall teach them your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land in which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon earth. Notice, God wants you and I to have days of heaven upon earth. Amen. 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 Every day a blessing day. If every day you were experiencing something from God, wouldn't you call that living like heaven on earth? Amen. He wants you to have days of heaven upon earth. Not one day, not one year, not just during the week of convention, but have days, plural, of heaven on earth. Can you say amen? amen. Look at somebody and tell them every day a blessing day. Amen. Job chapter 36 verse 11 says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days, plural, in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Days, every day. Every day a blessing day. They shall spend their days in prosperity. Once again, not one day, not one week, not one year, but their days every day. Every day a blessing day. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 8 and verse 12. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee to bless all the work of thine hand. Are your hands doing something every day? I said, are your hands doing something every day? Then if God's blessing is on the work of your hand and you're doing something with your hands every day, then you have every right to expect every day to be a blessing day. Can you say amen? Are you still with me? The contemporary English version says, he will make you successful in everything you do. This means once again that the blessing is working every day. Listen to Psalm 37, verse 18 and 19. Now all these scriptures are in my new book and uh, I don't have time to go over all of them in this morning session, but I'm telling you, you need to get a hold of the revelation of the power of the blessing and how that it can work and God wants it working in your life every day. <laughs> Psalm 37, 18 and 19. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil times or troubled times and in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. What's God saying? that the blessing should be working in your life even in troubled times, evil times, even in times of famine or, or drought or lack, the blessing should be working. The message translation says, in hard times, they'll hold their heads up high. 
when others' shelves are bare, theirs will be full. Hallelujah. That's the blessing working every day. Can you say amen? amen? The New International Version says, in times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. And the New American Standard says, they will have abundance. Praise God. That's the blessing working even in worst of times. Can you say amen? So my suggestion to you today is let the Word of God be final authority. Don't let CNN be final authority. Don't let the so-called experts be final authority. Don't let the non-believer be final authority. Don't let unbelieving believers be final authority. Let the Word of God be final authority. Let it settle it for you and your house. Now, Psalm 90 Verses 14 and 16 say, Satisfy us with thy mercy. And mercy is, is a uh, uh, covenant word. It's a characteristic of the blessing. Satisfy, satisfy us with thy mercy that we may rejoice all our days. Satisfy us with your mercy, with your goodness, with your blessing, with your favor so that we will rejoice all the days of our lives. Now, it says, and let thy word appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Now, listen to the message translation. I love this. Let me, let me read it from the King James again. Satisfy us with thy mercy that we may rejoice all our days. Listen to this. Surprise us with your love at daybreak. Let your servants see what you're best at. Bless your children. What is that saying? What God is best at is blessing his people. I love it. Surprise us with your love at daybreak. I'm not surprised that the blessing shows up. I'm not surprised that his favor shows up. I'm not surprised that his love and his mercy and his goodness show up. I am surprised at how he goes about doing it. Amen. I love surprises. Anybody else love surprises? Amen. Surprises. I remember right here in this convention. Let's see. It would have been 1987. Right here in this convention. I'm building a medical facility in an African nation and our phase one was an outpatient clinic where we could treat between two and 400 patients a day. And Brother Oral Roberts found out I was doing it and he wanted to team up with me. And he said, you build the clinic and I'll staff it with doctors and nurses that have graduated from ORU. So we teamed up to do this. My job's to build it and he's going to staff it. And so, uh, I sent a team over there to, to oversee this project and uh, I'm paying for it as I go, paying cash as I go. And let me just uh, give you a little hint here. If you think building a medical facility in a third world country is cheap, you've never built one. It's not cheap. Just because it's a third world country, it's not cheap. And so we have invested hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into this project. And this is just phase one. And along the way, Brother Roberts is challenged to have it finished by a certain date. Some of you will remember it was at this time when the media got all over him saying that he said that if he didn't raise $8 million, God was going to kill him. I mean, if you remember that, well, that's not what he said, but the media made it out like that. And what he wanted the $8 million for was because his doctors and nurses, most of them had to take out loans to go to medical school. And then by the time they got their license to practice medicine, they were so deep in debt, they couldn't go to the mission field because they had to pay their debts off. 
And so brother, brother Roberts was believing to raise $8 million so he could pay their debts off and send them to the mission field and not have that pressure of debt on them. The media forgot to tell you that part. Well, I'm building this facility and he is making it his model. And now he's got to have this done by certain date, which I had never intended to put a time limit on it. But who am I to argue with Oral Roberts, even though it's my project? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he calls me to Tulsa and he says, we're having a board meeting next week and I want you to tell that board we're going to have this thing ready by this day. I said, Brother Roberts, we're not going to have it ready by that day. He said, you go in there and tell them we're going to have this ready by that day. I said, Brother Roberts, we will not have it ready by that day. He said, you go in there and tell them we're going to have it ready by that day. I said, I'll go in there and tell them we're going to have it ready by this day. In other words, he intended for me to get on the ball, which I already was on the ball, but he just made the ball bigger, you know. And uh, so now, man, we, we, we pushing hard to get this thing ready so he and I can go over there and dedicate it, you know. And so anyway, I think I've got it all done. Coming into this convention, 1987, I think I've got it all done. We're ready to go over there in just, you know, 30, 60 days from the time this convention's over. And the day before this convention started, my director from there called and said, Brother Jerry, I thought we had everything done. And uh, we've still got something that's come up that the government's insisting that we do before they'll give us the permit to open. I said, what's it going to cost? He told me it was a lot of money. Well, I didn't have any more money designated for that project. I had money in other accounts for other projects, but I can't take money out of there and use it on this. That's misappropriating funds. But I didn't have any other money for this. And uh, he said, we've got to have this or, or we can't do the dedication. Well, I'm not going to Oral oh, Roberts and tell him we're not going. <laughs> you don't tell Oral oh, Roberts you're not going. There's, there's three people I've learned not to argue. No, four people I've learned not to argue with. God, Oral Roberts, Kenneth Copeland, and Carolyn. <laughs> I probably should have put Carolyn at the top. <laughs> and, uh, you know, man, we, got, we still got to have a ton of money for this to happen. So we come into this convention. And uh, I don't know where the natural where the money's coming from. So the first night of this convention, Brother Copeland gets through preaching. And uh, we all go back to our hotel. And we were staying at the Worthington Hotel that year. And uh, myself and uh, my wife, and I think Happy and Jeannie Caldwell were in the elevator with us. And I know John and Marty Copeland were in the elevator with us. And I think Jesse and Kathy. Or, or maybe it was uh, another couple. I can't remember now. But there were several of us who had just come from the convention and we're all going up to our rooms. We push the button for our floor. We're all talking, you know, probably talking about the service or something or whatever. And the doors start to close. And just before they close, two little hands press through there trying to open them. You've done that before in the elevator, you know. And these two hands just came through and did all it could do to open those doors. So I pushed the open button and they opened up and this little woman came on. She said, thank you. Now, she was in a jogging suit. Had on tennis shoes, a jogging suit. Didn't have a purse with her. Didn't have a Bible with her. Uh, she didn't look like she had come from the convention. I thought it was just a guest at the hotel, you know. And maybe she'd been to the gym or maybe she'd been walking around the block getting some exercise, whatever. And, you know, she just said thank you. And then she pushed her floor and a button for her floor. And she just stood there. And we're all talking, you know. And in a little while, it opened for her floor. 
And she started to get out and then she reached in her pocket and turned around and said, Brother Jerry, God told me this would happen. And she hands me a check. And the, she walks out, the doors are closing almost before I can say, thank you. So she hands me a check. He got silent in the elevator. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> and I looked at the check and it was $30,000. Exactly what I needed to finish that project. $30,000. Now, as far as I was concerned, it was God saying, surprise. <laughs> if I had been selecting the person to do this, I probably wouldn't have selected the little lady with the jogging suit who had no person, no Bible. If you had been selecting the person to do this, you'd have probably looked for the guy with a $2,000 suit, $800 shoes, you know, the one who seemed most likely or capable, which showed me again, and God's done it so many times. He's got ways that you and I couldn't dream up in a thousand years. Amen? Amen. God can do it in ways you and I couldn't dream up in a thousand years. Amen. And the need was met and we were right on time and we got it done. Praise God. Amen. Now, that's what this verse said. It said, surprise us, O Lord, with your love. Not that we're surprised that his love is manifested, but we're surprised at how he goes about doing it. Can you say amen? Surprised at how the favor of God and the blessing of God manifest in our lives. Look at somebody and tell them again, every day a blessing day. Amen. Psalm 128 verse 5 says, The Lord shall bless thee and thou shalt see good all the days of thy life. When the blessing of God is on your life, you will see good, good things will happen all the days of your life. Now, once again, like I said yesterday, this doesn't mean you'll never have any more adversity. It doesn't mean that you'll never have challenges. Those things come. But the blessing and the favor of God makes you superior to them. You'll be able to say like Joseph did, what they meant for bad, God turned into something good. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It's by the mercy of God, the favor of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God, that we're not consumed. If it wasn't for God's mercy and God's goodness and God's kindness toward us, We'd be consumed by what's going on in this world just like the rest of the world is. But thank God we are not consumed because we have access to His mercy, His favor, His goodness, His kindness, His blessing. And then it says, and they're new every morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? New favor every day. New manifestations every day. Praise God. Every day a blessing word, a day. Now, in closing this session today, there's a key word connected to all this, and that word is expectancy. It is a proven fact that what you expect the most is what you get, good or bad. In the... Uh, Secular world, uh, you may have heard this phrase. A lot of motivational speakers use it. Self-help books use it. Law of attraction. What you expect is what you get. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 8, 13, for example. As thou hast believed so be it done unto thee. 
But when you truly believe, you have expectancy. Amen. Amen. If you truly believe that God is going to meet a need in your life, then you are expectant of it. If you're not expectant of it, you're not truly believing, you're just hoping and wishing. But if you truly believe, then you're going to be expectant of it. Can you say amen? How many of you believed months ago that you were going to be at this convention? How many of you, right along with your believing it, had expectancy of it? Well, look what happened. Here you are. Can you say amen? amen? I love the message translation here in Matthew 8, 13. It says, what you believed could happen has happened. What you believed could happen has happened. Get up every day, not only thanking God for the blessing and thanking God for his favor, but get up every morning expecting it to manifest. Yeah, but Brother Jerry, what if it doesn't happen? Then get up the next morning expecting it. Yeah, but what if it doesn't happen? Get up the next morning expecting it. Just don't ever change your attitude about it. The more you expect it, the more you're going to experience it, praise God. Can you say amen? amen? I can tell you this, that the things that I have desired and believed for and expected to come to pass have always come to pass. Amen. Amen. The Bible says if you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. And I'm I'm one of these strange guys that loves adventure. (laughs) I always, as a little boy, I always wanted to jump out of airplanes. I was a little boy, I'd, I'd watch him parachute, you know, on TV. World War II movies or something. And I thought, man, I'd like to do that. I went and stole one of my mother's sheets. Got some rope out of my daddy's garage. Tied rope around four corners of the sheet. Tied it under my arms. Went up to the highest tree I could find. Jumped out of that thing thinking that sheet's going to work like a parachute. Sheet hung in the tree. I hit the ground and knocked the breath out of me. My mama come out there and I was going, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> couldn't breathe. <laughs> I just wanted to jump out of an airplane. I know Charles Capp's story. He wanted to, he wanted to fly. And his brother talked him into getting on top of the barn, I think. And they took shoebox lids and, and strapped them to their arms. And they jumped off the barn and flapped and hit the ground. And Charles asked his brother, said, why didn't it work? And he said, you didn't flap fast enough. (laughs) But, you know, when I was in the military, they put me in a 4.2 mortar platoon. I I wanted to be a paratrooper. And you gotta understand, in those days, I was not the big hunk of a man I am today. I used to be little. And... I weighed, I think I weighed 119 pounds when I went to basic training. But those three square meals, man, it wasn't long. I was up to 124. (laughs) Brother Copeland said years ago when I first went to work with him, he said, I've lost three men the size of Jerry Savelle. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, they said, "I, I, I wanted to go to, I wanted to be a paratrooper. And the guy said, Son, the gear weighs as much as you. You'd hit the ground before the chute opened. (laughs) So they put me in a 4.2 mortar platoon. And uh, so anyway, it was still a desire. Well, you know, I'd tell Carolyn, man, I want to skydive. You're not skydiving. And she'd hear me say it every three or four or five years. Man, I want to go skydiving. You are not skydiving. (laughs) Well, when I turned 50, which was uh, almost 17 years ago, she surprised me. And for my 50th birthday, she bought me 
a certificate to go skydiving. And I had to go over to Gaines, uh, Denton, Texas and, and go through school that day. And then we went up that afternoon, you know, and man, I went through the class over there and there was about 20 of us and all the other ones, they were between 18 and 25 years old and I'm an old man. And they were all going to do it tandem. I wanted to do it by myself. They thought I was the coolest old man they'd ever been around. I rode my Harley over there, you know, and, and I'm the only one that's going to do this by myself. They all going to be strapped to a, a jump master, you know. And we went through the training and all that, and then we went up that afternoon. We got up 12,500 feet. I'm sitting there, and the pilot, and he says, Jerry, you ready? And I got three jump masters uh, in the uh, airplane with me. I'm going to jump out first, then they're all going to jump. We're going to form a circle. They're going to make sure, you know, I go through the procedures properly. No. And so he said, Jerry, you ready? I said, I've been ready for this all my life. He said, well, get out on the wing strut. Man, I walked out on that wing strut. And uh, he said, anytime you're ready. And I let go and got in position. And I did a free fall for 7,000 feet. Man, you talk about awesome. And then they joined me and I got an altimeter strapped to my chest, you know, and so I can look at my altitude and I'm supposed to pull the rip cord at 5,500 feet. And so we're all looking, they're pointing at the altimeter to make sure that I pull the rip cord, pull the rip cord. Now in training, they try to tell you what's about to happen when you pull the rip cord. But the training don't do it justice. I pulled that rip cord and it jerked me straight up and I heard myself say, oh my God. You know. <laughs> it jerked me straight up, man. And, and then you're supposed to make sure, you know, your, your chute opened and make sure it's not tangled up. And if it is, you got an emergency chute and you go through those procedures. Man, I don't, everything's cool. And now you just drive that chute down to your target. And I'm sitting up there you know, driving this chute down for the night, last 5,000 feet, land on my target, get up and roll my chute up, get my cell phone out, call Carolyn, the eagle has landed. <laughs> I said, Carolyn, this is everything I thought it would be. I'm going up again. And if I keep coming back every weekend, I can be a jump master in 30 jumps. She said, the eagle's feathers have just been plucked. <laughs> you are done, boy. You don't know what you put me through this morning. Get yourself home. <laughs> you know what my father-in-law did? He called me the morning I was going over there and he said, you really going to jump out of the airplane? I said, yes. He said, put that 57 Chevy convertible in your wheel for me. <laughs> Oh, it was awesome. Got on my Harley and all them 18 year olds are thinking, that's the coolest old man we ever seen. You know. Well, then another dream was to fly in a fighter jet. Man, I want to fly in a fighter jet. I want to, I want to do combat missions without the combat. <laughs> you know. Well, see the favor of God makes things like these happen. The favor of God causes dreams that nobody else knows about to become reality. And my staff blessed me while I was in Australia one time, a few couple of years ago, with an opportunity to fly in a jet that belonged to the New Zealand Royal Air Force. Got out there and went through the training got in that jet with the pilot. He said, now, Jerry, what is it that you'd like to do? I said, everything you can allow me to do. He said, not many people tell me that. <laughs> he said, in fact, not many people who ride with me last more than 10 minutes. He said, the worst part of this job is cleaning up this airplane. <laughs> I said, I, I, I've been ready for this all my life. He said, all right. 
Man, we took off. Now we got another jet with a video cam. We got a video cam in the cockpit, you know. And so uh, we take off. And man, in a little while, he said, what do you want to do first? I said, go vertical. Let's pull some G's. <laughs> Straight, my face is like this. <laughs> oh, if they could have tied it off while we're up there like that. I was chiseled instead of this. You know. Man, we pulling some G's. And I said, I can't wipe the smell off. He said, that's the G's. He said, what do you want to do next? And man, he turned that thing upside down and we come down and flew over the ocean, 500 feet above the ocean, upside down. Man, we're doing 360s. We, we're doing everything. I can't wipe the smile off my face. He kept saying, you have a strong constitution. You have a strong constitution. He said, I like flying with you. Come back and do it again. It was wonderful. And I could hardly wait to get back home. And, and they had made a, 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 a DVD of it with those cameras they had and got to show it to the staff. And they had put the theme to Top Gun with it. <laughs> I went through the danger zone. Oh, man, it was awesome. Awesome. That's a favor of God. I don't know why I'm God's favorite child. I just am. That's the way it makes you feel when every desire you've ever had, he makes it happen and even better than you dreamed it. That's the favor of God. Amen. That's the favor of God. And folks, it's on you just as much as it's on me. Now learn to expect it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Amen. Learn to expect it every day of your life. Come on, stand up with me if you will, please. Hallelujah. Get every resource you can on the blessing of God and the favor of God. And you study it like never before. And I'm telling you, you're going to find out that no matter what's going on in this world in the days ahead, the blessing of God and the favor of God will get you over. Praise God. Come on, give the Lord your best shout this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As the priest and the prophet of this service right now, lift your hands. I speak unprecedented favor over your life. I speak unprecedented favor over your life, favor manifesting in ways you've never experienced before. And I decree in the name of Jesus that because of unprecedented favor, this is going to be a record-breaking year for you. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Amen. Yeah.